Good morning, everyone. How's everyone doing? It's a beautiful Friday morning, so we can't say that we're doing bad. Um, hello, my name is Sierra Hoisington. I'm the Associate Executive Director for the Dink Darling Wildlife Society. And we are the nonprofit fundraising arm for the J and Dink Darling National Wildlife Refuge. By a show of hands, how many people love Dink Darling? Better see every hand raised in this studio. Yeah, that's great. So we are so happy to fill in the gaps where federal funding falls short. And as we all know, that happens more and more every single year from staffing to programs to outreach. Um, that's where we all come in. And a lot of you here are supporters and donate to us, and we thank you. Um, lectures like this could not be done without philanthropy. So thank you so much for the part that you play in that. Yes, thank you. So a little bit more about us. We've got this wonderful video that we'll play that explains a little bit more, and then we'll get to why we're all here. Wildlife Refuge of today isn't here by chance. In the early 1940s, Jay Norwood Darling, for whom the refuge is now named, was instrumental in the effort to block the sale of environmentally valuable land to developers. Ultimately, at his urging, President Harry S. Truman signed an executive order creating this refuge in 1945. In 1982, the Ding Darling Wildlife Society Friends of the Refuge began. Its purpose was to educate visitors about the importance of protecting lands, waters, and wildlife. In 1999, this group of volunteers stepped up to lead the building of the Refuge's Visitor and Education Center. This was the first partnership of its kind, where a friends group raised money to construct a federal building. And it is still the hub of the Refuge today. Why was this necessary? And what is the society's role today? Well, over the decades, the refuge budget has been cut 60%, and it has half the staff it formerly did. Meanwhile, visitors have increased 66% to nearly 1 million people annually. The refuge cannot meet their growing needs alone. So the Dane Darling Wildlife Society works to fill in the gaps where federal funding falls short. Most importantly, the refuge keeps Ding Darling's spirit alive by educating generation after generation about the importance of conservation. So visitors from around the world will take that knowledge back to the communities where they live. Today, with the help of generous donors, the society supports the refuge in these primary areas. Land acquisition and restoration, advocacy, conservation education, wildlife protection, biology and water quality research, and internships. What really draws people to Sandbell and the core objective of people is to come and enjoy the JN Ding Darling National Wildlife Refuge. I think Ding Darling would, would just be ecstatic over the fact that, that there are people that are carrying on his legacy. I mean, he obviously gave from his pocketbook, gave from his heart, but he would be ever so gratified to know that that legacy that he started continues today. The best legacies are not what you do for yourself today, but what you do for the next generation. I wanted to be at the refuge because there were things that I could do here. See, every time I come to volunteer, I see the important work of, of that's being done by the Dean Darling Wildlife Society. I see the smile on children's faces and families who are enjoying nature and wildlife. It is so wonderful, it really is, to know that all of this work will be protected for the next generation because of the work that the society has accomplished. Because if we don't do it, who will? Who will do it? To that end, the Ding Darling Wildlife Society is dedicated to ensuring that Ding's legacy lives on at the JN Ding Darling National Wildlife Refuge. 
We invite you to join us and our thousands of members in supporting the refuge for generations to come. So that's just a little bit more about us, and we thank all of you for all your support. Like the video said, we could not do it without our generous donors and supporters, and for that, again, we thank you. Um, we do have a sign-up sheet for our e-newsletter, Ding on the Wing. That is the best way to find out all the free programs, activities, events that we are having at the Refuge. So as you leave, please um, check that out as well. And without further ado, why we all are here, um, I'd first like to thank our lecture sponsors, Sonia Keen and John Moy, Pat Apino, and in memory of Roddy West, and in appreciation for the Ding staff. Uh, they really, truly made this lecture happen, and we give them a big thanks. Jack Davis is an author and professor at the University of Florida. He holds the Rotham Family Endowed Chair in the Humanities and teaches environmental history and sustainability. He earned a bachelor's degree and master's degree from the University of South Florida and a PhD from Brandeis University. Jack is the author or editor of several books, including The Gulf, The Making of an American Sea, which was the winner of the 2018 Pulitzer Prize in History. His previous book, An Everglades Providence, Marjorie Stone, Stoneman Douglas and the American Environmental Century. This dual biography of Amer America's premier wetlands and the woman who led a movement to save it won the gold medal in nonfiction from the Florida Book Awards. Davis, who writes mainly for intellectually curious audience, has a fellowship at the McDowell Colony and escaped to create. While writing The Bald Eagle, he was a recipient of the Andrew Carnegie Fellowship. His newest book, which we have available uh, for sale outside in the lobby and in our nature stores, is The Bald Eagle, The Improbable Journey of America's Bird. This is filled with spectacular stories of our founding fathers, propitious hunters, heroic bird rescuers, and the lives of bald eagles themselves. This book demonstrates how this bird, wondrous journey, may provide inspiration as we grapple with the environmental peri peril on a larger scale. Please join me in welcoming Jack Davis. Thank you, thank you all for coming out. What a wonderful turnout. Such a beautiful day and you're inside listening to me. I don't know if I do that. I don't know if I come to listen to myself on a day like today. Um, I, I was just in, uh, also let me put that in perspective, I was just in Seattle uh, yesterday as a matter of fact. And uh, Seattle was like Seattle. Uh, not like this in other words. So um, it's, it's uh, nice to be back in Florida and to enjoy uh, springtime here. So, and it's nice to be back here. I want to thank the Dean Darling um, uh, Wildlife Society for, for hosting me. I've spoken in Sanibel a number of times over the years on Marjorie Stubbins Douglas and on the Gulf and, and on the Bald Eagle uh, a couple of years ago. And was it a year ago? Two years ago, I don't remember. It was something like that. I think it was a year ago. And so, but before the book came out, the book came out on March 1, and uh, this bird is a, a very popular American bird, as, as you know. Uh, obviously, you're out here to, uh, this morning to, to hear about it. And I want to start by telling you why I chose to write this book. Uh, after I finished the Gulf of Mexico, I was searching around for a new topic. Um, and uh, I write my books for a general audience, not for my colleagues. Uh, as much as I love my colleagues and appreciate their work, but you write an academic book, it ends up on a cold steel library shelf, uh, and, and uh, it passes the $20 test. The $20 test is you go pull your book, go to your um, university library, pull your book off the shelf, turn to page 100, put a $20 bill in there, put it back on the shelf, come back 10 years later, and you, you, you retrieve your $20 without interest. Interest on a couple of levels. Not just monetary level, and so, uh, so anyway, when I wrote the book Golf, it was important to me to write it for a general audience. So, the, so America would know about the sea that's more than just an oil sump in it, Hurricane Alley, and but the bald eagle, it just it came to me I, after I finished the Gulf, You know, maybe the bald eagle needs its story told. People are becoming more and more familiar with it. We say ten years ago. 20 years ago, we, I mean, to see a bald eagle was a very rare sight. 10 years ago, it was still, you know, a fairly uncommon sight. And now we're seeing them all, all the time. You know, we spent 
uh, most of our lifetime without seeing bald eagle, this, this wondrous bird is, as we know. And now they've come back into our lives and, and we, we've embraced them. And so I wanted people who uh, are interested in the bald eagle, what, what American doesn't love the bald eagle? Whether you're red, white, and blue American, a, tr a tree hugger, or a butterfly chaser, or a birder, or all those in one, we love the bald eagle. Um, and so I thought it would be uh, that, that Americans would like to know a little something about this bird and its historic relationship. Uh, with, uh, with, with this country and the people of this country. And, it's a, and it is indeed an, an interesting relationship, uh, much more interesting than, than I realized uh, when, uh, before, uh, before I started researching and, and writing this book. And uh, you know, not only did I encounter a fascinating species, but I encountered a, a fascinating uh, history of the species, a biography, essentially. Um, now, of course, we know the bald eagle uh, primarily before we started seeing it in the sky so often. And, I, and you know, when we see it, I like to say it's when it poke the guy in the next, uh, poke the guy in the ribs next to you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, I lost something. Uh, poke the guy in the ribs next to you. You know, excitement when we see a bald eagle. But before we saw, it, now it's back. Um, before. <laughs> Okay, you're gonna stay there. Uh, you know, of course, we knew the bald eagle as, as a symbol of the nation. Uh, and it's really an interesting story how it became the symbol of the nation, which I write about in the book. And I don't want to give away too much um, uh, because I want you to read the book and support uh, the, the Wildlife Society by purchasing the book, which I'm happy to sign. And if you brought golf books, I'm happy to sign those too. And, but, so it, it, the, the bald eagle uh, was put on the, when the, the great seal was adopted in 1782 with the bald eagle on the front of the seal. It was not an obvious choice, I have to say. And I know a lot of you guys are out here thinking, oh, you know what Ben Franklin wanted. Uh, well, you're wrong, by the way. And I'm not gonna tell you how you're wrong. <laughs> He did not propose, well, he did not propose a turkey for the great seal of the United States, as many people believe. He proposed somebody else altogether, and if you read the book, don't shout it out. Uh, and uh, you won't believe who he, or what he wanted for the great seal of the United States. He was on the original committee to devise the seal, along with Jefferson and Adams, John Adams, sensational stellar cats. You know, Franklin, Jefferson, Adams, who better? Um, but that committee failed miserably. And it was another six years before we finally got the seal that we have today. Uh, and, that, and it was Charles Thompson, who was the, uh, uh, the president of the Continental Congress, who said, we must put the bald eagle on the front of the great seal. He said, he insisted that the, the, the eagle on the front of the seal be an American bald eagle, as he wrote in his instructions. Now, you can say, well, eagles have been on coats of arms and the uh, regalia and seals of nation states dating back to the Greeks and the Romans, you know, the ancient Greeks and the Romans. Uh, and that's true, but you look at those eagles and they're non-ornithological. They don't represent any particular species. Um, this is the first to go on a nation state seal that was an identifiable species. And it's a highly identifiable species with this white head and white tail and dark body. Uh, and Charles Thompson was, a, it was a brilliant selection on his part because America at the time, this is 1782, one year before America goes, uh, went to Paris to sign the peace treaty with, with Great Britain. And uh, the United States, this new republic, was, uh, was intent on asserting its own identity separate of European influence. It didn't want to be known as the offspring of Great Britain. It didn't want to be like, apologies to any Canadians in here, uh, like Canada or Australia who you know, maintain this, um, uh, this attachment to the, the quote unquote mother country. It wanted to be its own. Uh, and 
And this was an ideal bird because the bald eagle is truly an all-American bird. It lives only in, at least uh, in wild, it lives only in North America. Uh, and, and, but also, it's a very charismatic bird. Uh, and it conveys uh, those qualities that the U.S., this young nation, wanted to convey to the world. Strength and courage. And unity as well. Freedom. Uh, is truly a, a, a bird, it's an ideal bird to represent, you know, freedom. Uh, but also, what I think is a, why it was a brilliant selection is, I'm not even going to try the point here because I'll probably turn something off, but this, this super orbital ridge above its eye, you know, its brow, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a bony ridge above its brow. It gives it that don't tread on me stare. Doesn't it? Uh, you know, this is a bird you don't want to reckon with, uh, and uh, and truly so. Now, in Americans, the bald eagle eagles have been before the great seal of the United States in 1782. Eagles, just general non-specific uh, eagles, you know, non-ornithological eagles, had been on in popular culture in in colonial America, uh, in uh, all, all, all types of decorative, uh, in the decorative arts and on signs and on uh, logos and so forth, uh, but not necessarily the bald eagle. But after the bald eagle went on the great seal of the United States, it became, the image became hugely popular. Americans started putting it on everything. You know, of course, uh, federal uh, insignia, uh, but also uh, in organizational logos, eventually on sports team uh, uniforms and, and their names, and uh, uh, you, you name it, you found the image of the bald eagle uh, in the United States, it became increasingly popular, remains one of the most popular animal images in America today. You know, on the back of motorcycle jackets. Anybody in here ever own an, an AMC eagle, the car? Really, nobody in here ever, are you, I think, I, I, I doubt, no. Somebody in there must have been on the name of the eagle, and they're too embarrassed to say. <laughs> that was a car that did not live up to its name. Uh, and, but Goodyear Eagle tires, I mean, it's everywhere, which are actually good tires, unlike the AMC Eagle. Uh, and, um, but uh, it's, it's everywhere. Americans embrace that image. And, and Again, immediately after it went on the Great Seal of the United States. But what they did not embrace was the living species. They didn't like the living species itself. Um, throughout the 19th century, on into the 20th century, an eagle scene was an eagle to be shot. It was a, it's an apex predator and was treated like other predators, such as wolves and coyotes uh, and mountain lions and bears. Uh, and and, and it, you, it was regarded as a civic duty uh, to, to shoot a bald eagle. If you saw one flying over the town or over your house, shoot it or do, poison it or club it. Look at these guys. You don't want, you would not want to run into these guys, you know, in, no, you know on the street, much less a dark alley. Um, but, I mean, this is, and I, I, I wonder about these children if they ever went into therapy. Or <laughs> and, but this was common. I did a search, when I was doing a research for the book, I did a search in newspapers.com, uh, which is, is a database for thousands of, uh, of, of daily and weekly newspapers dating back to the colonial period. A fantastic database. Uh, anybody in here use newspapers.com? It's it's, isn't it a wonderful? It's just fantastic. I did a search from 1850 to 1920 uh, using three words in quotation marks, bald eagle shot. And I came up with 140,000 hits, over 140,000. Um, just about any day uh, in newspapers.com throughout that period, you could find articles uh, uh, about a bald eagle being shot. And, the, and, it, and these articles, were uh, just neutral. They were. They were, did not condemn the shooting of a bald eagle. In some cases, they were congratulatory, and uh, it, because it was just such a common and everyday affair. 
And it was these shootings or clubbings in some cases of bald eagles were reported like uh, uh, John or Jane Smith had gone down to the lake and caught a 25 pound largemouth bass. Uh, and, uh, and the eagle's weight was always reported uh, and it's, uh, the size of its wingspan was, was always reported and how it had been shot. And sometimes these, these articles are very dramatic in their telling of the shooting of, of these bald eagles. And so as a result, by the end of the 20th, by the end of the 19th century, bald eagles had all but disappeared from the eastern seaboard states. Now let me put that in perspective. Uh, uh, when Congress adopted the Great Seal of the United States uh, in Philadelphia, which is where the Capitol was then, at the State House, the uh, bald eagles nested along the Delaware River. They had a nest that had nests on Delaware on the Delaware River uh, every one to two miles. And when the uh, Europeans began settling the U.S., uh, or what became the U.S., settling North America, the estimated population of bald eagles was 500,000. Uh, now, late 19th century, they were a rare sight in these eastern seaboard states, states where they had been quite common at one time. So rare that people thought they were Rocky Mountain birds. Can you believe that? Rocky Mountain birds. Uh, and and so we hear about the slaughter of the bison, and, but um, we don't hear about the slaughter of the bald eagle, which was every bit as great as, and destructive as the bison. Uh, and by, by the uh, late 19th century, early 20th century, the bald eagle was at risk of going extinct in the lower 48 states. 1917, Alaska, the territory of Alaska, imposed a bounty on bald eagles to protect allegedly to protect the salmon industry. Uh, and that ball and that bounty remained in place until 1952. And during that period, the territory of Alaska paid bounties on a, over 128,000 bald eagles. You had to turn in a set of talons to get your 50 cents. Uh, and so many people were worried that the bald eagle began worrying in the early 20th century, that the bald eagle would go the way of the passenger pigeon, which disappeared which the last one died in the Cincinnati Zoo in 1914. Uh, or the Carolina parakeet, the last one died also in the Cincinnati Zoo in 1918. Don't, don't ever live in the Cincinnati Zoo. <laughs> Anybody here from Cincinnati? <laughs> and uh, stay away. No, I'm sure, I'm sure it's a, uh, I know that the, the zoo in, uh, 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 Columbus is, is a nice zoo. I've never been to the one in Cincinnati. I'm not sure I want to, but in any case, uh, people were concerned about losing the bald eagle, and a number of people uh, organized uh, to lobby for federal protection for the bald eagle, to lobby against the, the uh, bald eagle bounty in, in Alaska. Now, the one organization you would think that would rise up against the destruction of the bald eagle and against the Alaska bounty would be the most influential and the, uh, and the, and the wealthiest conservation organization of the day. Uh, this is the early 20th century, the National Audubon Society. It did not. Uh, it was led by T. Gilbert Pearson, a Floridian, who was, up, uh, who, uh, was from Archer, Florida, up there where I live, in Gainesville. And uh, he was president and he would not take a stand to protect the bald eagle. So, oh, oh, gosh, oh my gosh, I forgot to tell you this. That's why I hate slides, because I, I can't stay in, in um, uh, keep myself on track. Um, so the bald eagle is, before I'm gonna start, let me backtrack a minute here. Uh, the bald eagle, the reason why, one reason why the bald eagle was shot all the time, as I said, it was accused of being a predator or it was a predator, but also was accused of a number of crimes it did not commit. Uh, ornithologists and others, experts, quote unquote experts, maintained that the bald eagle would, could, would fly off with calves and, and sheep uh, and, and pigs and chickens. Now a bald eagle can carry a chicken away. It can lift about five pounds if it's a big bald eagle and it has momentum behind it, but it can't carry away a calf 
or a sheep. And so even the even ornithologists are testifying in Congress that this is what bald eagles do. But also mothers were warned, don't leave your children unattended outdoors unless you want a bald eagle to carry it away. And the ornithologists are saying this. John James Audubon, others, into the 20th century, they're saying this. Uh, and the McGuffey's Reader, which was next to the Bible, was the most read book in the 19th century, a primer for immigrants who wanted to learn English and for school children, had a story about uh, a bald eagle carrying away a child to its nest and the town rising up to try to uh, save the child. And the image that accompanied this art, uh, this story in McGuffey's Reader was of a girl who must have been at least six or seven years old. And this is a still from the movie Rescue from the Eagle's Nest, uh, put out by Edison Studios in 1908. You can watch it on YouTube, by the way. You know, it's a silent film. Uh, there's no sound that uh, goes along with it on, on YouTube. But it's a silent film. And in this, the story is this, uh, this lumberjack, uh, the, the film opens up with a lumberjack uh, stepping outside of his cabin with his wife and child uh, where they uh, live in the woods, kissing them goodbye and then skipping off with his ax to, uh, for his uh, day of work, leaving his wife and child behind. And the mother leaves the child outside and goes inside the cabin. And then you see in the next frame, you see a bald eagle, or a, this eagle, and pretty scary looking, flying across above the, the cabin with the, the child outside. And you can hear, even though this is, uh, there's no sound on YouTube, you can hear the organ in the orchestra pit, you know, rising uh, in tone as this eagle flies past. And then it comes along and picks up, it's, it's on, it's on wires. You can see the wires in the film. And <laughs> the wings are moving about like, just like this. And it swoops down, snatches up the baby, and carries away. And you can see this poor child has her own wires. Uh, and she's crying. She's not acting, she's crying. This is in the days before protections for a child actor. Uh, and, uh, and carries the, uh, uh, the child away, and the mother panics, uh, understandably, uh, and runs and finds her husband, uh, who uh, makes his way to a cliff and over the edge and down on, the, on this ledge is the, is the eagle's nest with the baby in it, and he climbs down. Uh, he gets into a fight with the eagle, uh, and uh, some more special effects from 1908, a club magically appears from one frame to the other in his hand. It just comes out of nowhere. Uh, and uh, he knocks the eagle out and kicks it over the ledge and celebrates and then rescues his daughter. And the, the actor playing the father was none other than D.W. Griffith. Does uh, anybody know who D.W. Who Griffith? He was the guy who made the 1915 film, uh, The Birth of a Nation, uh, the film that inspired the second reincarnation of the Ku Klux Klan uh, in, in that same year. Uh, interestingly, the reviewers of the film panned him as an actor, uh, and then he went into directing. So you have to wonder if they had liked his acting, if he would have never made The Birth of a Nation. Uh, but, so, uh, all these myths about the bald eagle are responsible for the decline of the population, and it's, it's, it's brushed with extinction. Uh, and uh, this woman, Rosalie Edge from Pennsylvania. Anybody here from Pennsylvania? Are you familiar? You know uh, Hawk Mountain Sanctuary? Yeah, yeah one, wonderful place. And Rosalie Edge, who was the founder of Hawk Mountain Sanctuary, was a member of, of, Audubon, of the Audubon Society. She pressured T. Gilbert Pearson to take a stand in support of the Bald Eagle for federal protection and uh, to uh, uh, rid uh, the, the country of the, the Bald Eagle bounty in Alaska. He wouldn't do it, so she started her own organization. I love the name of it, uh, the Emergency Conservation Committee. And she took on Audubon, uh, and she and Willard Van named the, the gentleman right here, uh, who was a naturalist, as they were called in those days, at the National Museum of Natural History, um, uh, a co-founder of the Emergency Conservation Committee. Uh, 
uh, were a along with others, were able to convince Congress in 1940 to pass the Bald Eagle Protection Act. Uh, it's a year before the United States uh, joined the war against uh, fascist tyranny, uh, and Congress and others were worried that uh, if it lost the living species behind this, this world-renowned symbol, symbol of freedom and democracy that would diminish the integrity of that symbol. Uh, so uh, Congress uh, voted with strong support uh, to support, uh, to pass this legislation, the Bald Eagle Protection Act, get, making the Bald Eagle the first individual species to be protected under federal law. Uh, other wildlife legislation before protected multiple species, uh, but the, uh, the Bald Eagle Protection Act was the first the bald eagle got its own law, in other words. But then five years later, what happened? 1945, August 1945, DDT is released on the, um, on, on the general market. And the population of the bald eagle, osprey, pelican, uh, birds across the country begins to decline significantly through uh, the late 40s and, and 1950s. And this man right here, Charles Broly, it was uh, the first person to make a connection between the decline of the bald eagle population and DDT. Charles Broly was a, a bald banker from Winnipeg uh, who retired to Tampa in the late 1930s. Did, did I, am I doing that? Okay. In the uh, late 1930s. Um, and uh, who had an interest in birds, but he was not a scientist. He was a banker. Uh, moved to Tampa in the 19, late 1930s and began climbing Loblolly and Longleaf Pine to ban eagles. Nobody was doing that at the time. Uh, he was the first person to start banning eaglets systematically. And he did this uh, until 1959, until age 79. He climbed these trees, uh, and he estimated that he climbed over 1,100 trees and banded some 1,260 eaglets. Um, and, uh, and, and, and what we learned from him, well, and he never fell out of a tree, by the way, and he devised his own technique for climbing up and, and banding these, these eaglets. And what we learned from his work is we learned a lot about the domestic life of bald eagles, but we also learned their migration patterns or lack thereof. I'm gonna show you a map in a little bit about their, where they might tend to migrate. Uh, but uh, people weren't sure whether bald eagles migrated or not. Some scientists were insisting they didn't. Uh, others were insisting, such as Rosalie Edge and Broiler Van Ayn, that yes, they did uh, migrate. Uh, but in the late 1950s, Throughout the 50s, he saw the bald eagle population in Florida just diminishing, just uh, precipitously. And, uh, and so he wrote an article about the connection between the bald eagle population and the increasing use of DDT. I mean, we saturated the lower 48 with DDT. Our homes, not, not just in agriculture, our homes, our lawns, our golf courses, our streets, mosquito control. You guys remember the mosquito truck that noisy damn thing that would drive down the road uh, in, in, um, in the afternoon or the evening, spraying the fog of DDT. And Rachel Carson talks about him in her 1960 book, 62 book, Silent Spring. And so um, uh, um, Carson brought awareness about the destructive uh, impact of, of DDT, as did others. And finally, in 1972, 1972 was a watershed year for the bald eagle, by the way. 1972, um, William Ruckelshaus, the uh, first administrator for the EPA, appointed by Richard Nixon, uh, banned the sale of DDT uh, in, in the US. There was a lot of pressure against this man not to do that, um, particularly coming from the uh, chemical industry, uh, but he did so. And, uh, and it was, a, and it was, we know today it was a, it was a smart move. It, DDT, of course, uh, had contaminated both uh, the wildlife uh, habitat, but their habitat is our habitat. Uh, and 
1972, three quarters of the nation's waters, freshwater and coastal waters, uh, were unsafe for swimming and fishing. Not only because of DDT, because uh, because of uh, untreated wastewater, which was prolific around the United States and the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, of course, industrial pollution uh, and um, ag and agricultural uh, runoff as, as well. So 1972, 50 years ago, Congress passed the Clean Water Act, uh, and which led to the cleanup of our uh, bays and bayous, um, the fishies, the watery habitat of bald eagles and ospreys. When I was a kid growing up on Tampa Bay, never saw a bald eagle never, in the 70s, never saw a bald eagle, never saw an osprey. About the only birds I saw were pelicans, brown pelicans, not very many, and gulls. And about the only fish I could catch was the damn croaker. Uh, if I got really lucky, I might get a speckled trout. Uh, and uh, because Tampa Bay was on the verge of ecological death uh, by, the, by the 1970s. So 72, DDT is banned, Clean Water Act is passed, and uh, also Congress uh, increased the penalty for harming uh, bald eagles that, that year. And then in 1973, Congress passed the Endangered Species Act. The bald eagle was one of the first to go to be listed in 1974 uh, as an endangered species. And so as America's waters were being cleaned up, as these habitats, as these estuarine environments, for example, are coming back to life, seagrass is coming back, fish are coming back, birds are coming back, um, the uh, Fish and Wildlife Service launched on, in the bicent bicentennial year, 1976, in the United States, an eagle restoration program around the country, uh, which depended upon, oh, I lost it again, um, which, which was, uh, uh, which were conducted in partnership with state wildlife officials and a lot of volunteers, such as this person, uh, Doris Mager who I'm gonna tell you about, and actually I'm gonna tell you, I'm gonna read about her in just a second uh, as, I, as I close. And so, some of you may be familiar, how many of you are familiar with the eagle restoration programs of the 1970s and 1980s? So what, uh, Paul is here. What Fish and Wildlife did, uh, along with state agencies, wildlife agencies, is, in, well, let me give you an example, in 1963, a, uh, Audubon conducted a nesting census of a nest census of bald eagles. 1963, in the lower 48, there were only 487 nests. Remember, there had been 500,000 bald eagles living in North America when Europeans began settling uh, the, the continent. But uh, so states such as in New England, Maine was the only New England state uh, in the 60s and early 70s that had any nesting bald eagles, and only something like four or five nests. Uh, no others in the New England states. Pennsylvania had no nesting eagles. Ohio, which today has 700, had no nesting eagles. Uh, Maryland, none. Uh, across the South, Alabama, Mississippi, none. Uh, Georgia, none. Uh, the Carolinas, one or two sporadically from one year to the next. Uh, Louisiana, one or two. Tennessee, no nesting bald eagles. Uh, it was truly on the brink of extinction. And, uh, and so this restoration program, uh, what the fish, what fish and Wildlife did was some states such as Michigan, northern parts of Michigan, Minnesota, uh, Alaska, um, whose bounty, by the way, was um, outlawed by uh, Congress in 1952, Alaska had a healthy uh, eagle, bald eagle population. Canada, they would bring eagles from those areas into places like Massachusetts and at five, six weeks old and raise them in what were called hack boxes, H-A-C-K. And they're like big giant lion cages that were up on stilts outside. Raise them, feed them from behind blinds, raise them in these makeshift nests and these hack boxes. And the, and the eaglets would, imprint on the, the territory, their surrounding environment. And, and in their minds, that surrounding environment became their natal territory. And eagles go back to their natal territory when they reach breeding age to find a mate and to build a nest 
uh, and to carry on uh, their, their species. Uh, and it became a, a phenomenal success across the country, these hack programs or hacking programs, um, uh, and restored the population in, uh, all, uh, in those states that had no nesting eagles. Now in the South, it was a little different. In the South, we have northern bald eagles and, and southern bald eagles. Northern bald eagles are larger than the southern bald eagles, and they can't take the heat in the South, and they don't have an immunity to an avian malaria that the southern bald eagles did. So all these southern states that had no bald eagles, nesting bald eagles, couldn't receive you know, eaglets from Michigan or, or Canada or Minnesota. Uh, and the only state that had a fairly healthy bald eagle population then was Florida. There were approximately, in 1970, approximately 300 nesting bald eagles in Florida. Not quite as large enough to take eaglets uh, and move them into the other states because then Florida would lose population. And so somebody came up uh, at the, the Sutton Center in Oklahoma, came up with a plan to take eggs out of the, uh, the bald eagle's nest in Florida, take them up to Oklahoma, incubate and hatch them beneath hens, and then raise them behind blinds, and when they reach six weeks old, move them into hack towers in places such as Alabama and Mississippi and Georgia and so forth. And, and over the course of four years in the 1980s, Florida Eagles, mainly up around where I'm from in North Central Florida, donated 275 eggs to the cause. So now when you see a, a nesting bald eagle in Tennessee or Alabama or Mississippi, more than likely it's a descendant of Florida Eagles. Go Gators. <laughs> now, but, Okay, you say, well, then you took the eggs out of the nest from the Florida eagles. Um, and, but we didn't lose any bald eagle population in Florida because they would take however many eggs were in the nest, take them all out. They're usually two, sometimes there's one, sometimes there's three, but they would take them all out soon after they were laid. And so how does the female respond to that? She lays a second hunch. Uh, so Florida eagles didn't lose any population. They're heroes. Uh, and um, now we have in Florida, we have uh, between 1,500 and 2,000 nesting bald eagles. Uh, that's why you're seeing so, so many of these days. This woman, Doris Megger, played a role uh, in bringing awareness to uh, the plight of bald eagles in, in Florida. Uh, she did a number of things which I'm going to read to you about, and then, then I'll stop then. Uh, and she uh, was also the person who uh, was convinced uh, the state of Florida to start conducting a, 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 a census of nesting eagles in the 1970s from, uh, from airplanes. And she did a number of other things. And um, she um, uh, also, um, along with others, including Florida Fish and Game, responsible for the egg relocation program I, I, I talked about. By 1999, the bald eagle population was healthy enough to come off of the endangered species list. Uh, bureaucratic inertia in Washington, you ever heard of that? <laughs> Delayed you listening to 2007 when the bald eagle population nationwide was um, uh, 10, between 10 and 11,000. In the 2010s, the bald eagle population quadrupled. Isn't that remarkable? Quadrupled. Um, now, that's thanks to the restoration program, that's thanks to the Clean Water Act, uh, and that's thanks to the Bald Eagle Protection Act, but it's also thanks to these guys themselves. And if any of you, how many of you guys watch the Southwest Florida nest camp? Well, oh, yeah, okay. I only saw one hand come over here. Uh, and so you're familiar with the domestic life of uh, eagles. It's also, what is also responsible for their phenomenal comeback, this great American uh, um, conser uh, uh, successful conservation story, is the bald eagles themselves. They have the ideal family values. Uh, they mate for life. Uh, they maintain a fidelity to their nest for life as long as it still exists. 
if it doesn't come down in a storm uh, or, or the tree doesn't rot and collapse. And they'll come back to that nest year after year after year. They can be 30, 40 years old. Um, they're great housekeepers. They, uh, every, when they return to their nest at the beginning of breeding season, they refurbish it, they add on to it. Nests get bigger year after year after year because they're constant renovators. Uh, one scientist in the 1920s measured a nest that was eight feet across and 12 feet deep. And when it came down in a storm, uh, the, 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 essentially the old hickory that it had been in for 35 years said enough is enough uh, and collapsed, that nest weighed up to two tons. They also, here, here is a, of course, they're refurbishing the nest here with uh, with Spanish moss, which makes nice bedding uh, for the center of the nest where the eggs are and the uh, eaglets spend their early uh, days. And they take such good care of their young that when they leave their territory, their natal territory at uh, age 16 to eight, uh, 20 weeks, they often weigh more than their parents. And, and this is where they go. Uh, oh, there's an immature, uh, which you, you've probably seen. They don't get their white tail feathers, full white tail feathers and head feathers until four to five years, years old, and that's when they reach breeding age. But um, here's a wonderful shot that was taken up by uh, where I live. But this is where they migrate. Look at these guys coming out. From, they, don't, they don't fly out, out here. I had to do it like this so, you could, so this wouldn't just be one big black swap. Um, but the, the eagles from Florida, they go as far as Canada. They migrate as far as Canada. Some of them just go to Georgia. Some of them stay within the state, don't migrate very far at all. Uh, but at the end of the breeding season, the juveniles will leave first. After they leave, uh, the parents leave. The female goes off in her direction. The male goes off in his, which probably has something to do about mating for life, and the success of mating for life. <laughs> And then they return at the end of the breeding season uh, again to their nest. And if their nest happens to be destroyed, they immediately start rebuilding. And it's all about location, 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 where they build a nest. They want a tall tree that has a good view of their territory. And, and in most cases, bald eagles build nests within a couple hundred yards of water where they're stitched. They, they will eat land animals and birds, but they prefer fish. They are considered a fishing raptor like osprey. And, but look, at they go all the way up here. They go uh, all these various places. The northern bald eagles come south uh, between breeding seasons. The southern bald eagles go north. I mean, look at these guys from Saskatchewan coming down to Colorado. And the Colorado birds go up to Saskatchewan. Uh, what is it called when you trade houses? Uh, and, uh, but they don't hang out in the nest between breeding season. They're branchers. They, they uh, spend their nights in branches and spend their days, of course, fishing and stealing fish from osprey and from each other, uh, by the way, which scientists say is smart behavior, stealing from uh, food from other animals. So let me, I want to read you just uh, about dwarf maggots because about, uh, I encountered a lot of really interesting um, people in this story along with interesting birds. And uh, Doris Maggard is, is one, of my, one of my favorites. And uh, uh, again, among, among so many. And uh, so I'm gonna read this, just give you a, a little bit of uh, flavor of the book and, uh, and then I'll take questions. Bulging out from between the upper branches of the loblolly pine, Bulging out from between the upper branches of a loblolly pine, a large finger lapped arrangement of sticks formed the familiar aesthetic of an industrious eagle couple. For some unknown reason, the pair had not returned for the 1979 nesting season. Staring up, Doris Bagger was aware of the centrality of nests in the lives of bald eagles. These compositions of meticulous labor, enigmas of intricacy and strength that marry art with utility are essential to the renewal of life. The identity of few birds is as closely attached to their nest as the bald eagles is to theirs. 
None in North America build larger or stouter ones. The bulge are emblematic of their species resilience. Nests have been a key variable in determining the population's decline, and they would be imperative to its revival. Without them, Magar knew there would be no birds. Magar was also aware of the violent, spontaneous weather that frequented central Florida. And at that moment, dark clouds filled the sky to the west. Standing at the foot of the loblolly, one hand hesitantly on a climbing ladder hanging down from the height of a fire lookout tower, she was intent on spending time in the nativity of the former occupants. Magar had never scaled a tree before, much less in a storm. She reached over and touched an ominous looking lightning scar running down the tree's trunk to the ground. Pushing ahead of the storm, the wind pulsed and the green needles trembled in the branches high above. One eyewitness described the tree as spindly. Another called it wind whip. Jeff Klinkenberg, the outdoor editor for the St. Petersburg Times, is the one who used the word spindly. Here she was, he reflected decades later, 53 years old and climbing a ladder I would not have dared to climb at my age then, 30. Before putting herself at the mercy of the swelling wind, Magger tied a red bandana around the, her head of silver hair, which she, had had, which she had had cut and styled in a new hairdo for the occasion. <laughs> owl earrings, owl earrings dangled beside her cheeks and retaining the rafter theme a spread eagle necklace wreathed her neck. She wore black jeans, a denim shirt, and gray running shoes, yet her jogging routine had been inconsistent of late. In relating that detail, she confessed to Klinkenberg, I've got fat little legs, and I probably shouldn't be that far off the ground at my age. She slipped into a safety harness secured to an upper branch. Alongside the harness line, the grounding cable of a lightning rod chased down the side of the tree. A number of precautions were taken that day, and Magar added one of her own by swallowing a motion sickness pill. pill. I get air sick and I get seasick, she again confessed to Klinkenberg, and I'm probably going to get nest sick. <laughs> Magar put one foot up on a lower rung and followed that with the other on the next rung. Grabbing a third at eye level with both hands, she stared nervously into the tree's rust-colored scaly bark and coaxed herself upward toward a 50-foot summit. Whenever the wind kicked up, the tree creaked like an old door. When it swung like one, she would pause, grip the ladder tighter, and take a deep breath. She shouted to a friend below, get down on your knees, Viola, and pray. <laughs> so what Nagar did, all they did, was she spent six days in this abandoned eagle's nest in central Florida to raise awareness about the plight of the bald eagles. This is 1979. Uh, and then she was also trying to raise funds uh, or money to fund the construction of an, uh, of an eagle aviary at Na National Audubon. She had started um, uh, raptor rehabilitation in the 1960s in her backyard. Um, and uh, now it was time by the 1970s to move her operations to a, a more legitimate facility. And, um, she, and she was successful. She, what she did, her, her nest in, as the press called it, gained national attention. Life Magazine, Time Magazine, uh, Look Magazine all reported on this. Uh, and, um, uh, oh, jeez, uh, Harvey, Harvey, that uh, radio guy. Paul Harvey, even Paul Harvey talked about her. Um, and she was the rest of the story, um, if you will. I interviewed her uh, a couple of years ago when she was 94. She lives in Washington State now. And she was phenomenal. Just She devoted her entire adult life to uh, raising awareness uh, 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 and, and, and providing uh, rehabilitation to, to raptors. She would travel across the country here she is after riding her bike at age 60 from San Diego to Merritt Island. Well, she's on the way to Merritt Island. She's in Tallahassee. This is Governor Bob Graham, um, uh, at, you know, recognizing her effort and declaring uh, this particular day, a day I don't re uh, remember, 1986. Uh, oh, it was uh, Flag Day in 1986, uh, Doris Magger Day in, in Florida. Uh, 
And she told me, I talked to her during in the middle of COVID. She said, as soon as COVID's finished, I'm going back out uh, and uh, I'm giving lectures. She's 96 years old now. Why don't I stop with Doris Magger and take any questions you might have? I think I was that informative. <laughs> yes. You had a significant drop in red shoulder hospital populations due to rat poisons. There's also lots of chicks in the southwest Florida yeah. where rat poisons. Is there any movement what to uh, control second generation rat poisons? Um, thank you for, for uh, bringing that. Uh, subject up. Uh, so he was talking about losing red-tailed hawks to rat poison. I always recommend people don't use rat poison uh, in your house or around your house because the rats invariably end up outside. They die. They're picked up by red hawks and the poison uh, makes its way up the food chain into the, the hawk or the owl uh, or even the bald eagle. And uh, I am in, in, in often it cripples them or, or, or they die. Uh, just like just like the rat does, and uh, I'm not aware of any movement of foot to uh, to change that. My 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 guess is that the rat poison industry is pretty powerful, um, and they they won't allow that to happen. Uh, and uh, so it's it's a matter of awareness. It's just like I, I try to make people aware: don't water your grass, uh, or if you do, don't fertilize it or put down pesticides because that is what fouls up our estuarine environment. Um, and so also I highly recommend do live track with a rat. I, you know, composting outside, which is great, unfortunately attracts rats, up so do citrus trees. And, um, and I have rats because I had a composting outside, which I don't anymore. And I, I for two years I've been trapping rats around my house in, in Gainesville, under my house, I have a crawl space. And what I do is I trap them in a live trap and I take them out to the airport and put them on a plane to Washington, D.C. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, no, I, I, uh, I do take them out to the airport, the Gainesville airport, and I've been fortunate that I'm trying try to train the red tails out there and the, to recognize my car because I've had red tails swoop down and grab the rat after I let it loose. So, um, and this is a poisonous rat, uh, and, but it's going back into, you know, it's, it's doing what it's supposed to do. Um, so please don't, don't use rat poison. I should say there's still dangers to, that, that the bald eagle is, 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 despite the population thriving, there's still dangers that it faces. And the greatest danger is lead poisoning from hunting. Now hunters are among our best conservationists, uh, and deer and elk hunters often, uh, you know, gut their their kill out in, out in the woods, which is convenient for them, but it's also recycling, right? But unfortunately, that the the that the gut pile they leave behind often is poisoned with uh, shards of, of lead from their shot or their bullets, and a shard of lead the size of a grain of rice can kill a bald eagle and that's their and call uh, california condors too that's the greatest threat to uh, california condors and but also also bald eagles something like 20 cent 20 percent of the bald eagles um, that die and die from from uh, lead poisoning car strikes are coming becoming uh, increasingly common don't throw you're not supposed to anyway but don't throw your mcdonald's hamburger out your car window uh, because they're, they're scavengers, just like black vultures. Uh, and so they get hit by cars, un unfortunately. They love our landfills, uh, which is um, can be potentially be dangerous to them if they pick up something that's poisonous in the landfill. Uh, and uh, the power industry is doing a good job in the wind gener at wind generator sites of installing uh, artificial intelligence technology uh, that has significantly reduce the collision between those big multi-ton blades uh, with, with, with birds, including bald and golden eagles. Uh, so I think we're pretty good on that front, uh, but it's, it's still that. So if you're a hunter, please use uh, copper uh, uh, bullets instead of, instead of lead. It's better for you too, because you know, it, can, it can get into your system. 
Any other questions? Yes. So yeah, the southwest. In the southwest, their 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 um, their population tends to be smaller. Scientists, you have to understand, uh, bald eagle is really new, fairly new to science scientific research because we just didn't have them. We were focusing on restoration, so science isn't sure why their population is smaller in, in the southwest than other parts of the United States. It could have something to do with the geography, the terrain. Uh, and it could also have something to do with uh, golden eagles, which uh, are more prolific in, in, the, in the southwest. They don't, they're not a fish-eating raptor. Uh, they they eat uh, uh, birds and land animals. Uh, so it can, could be a lack of, of aquatic food sources for bald eagles that are responsible for that. Uh, also, um, part of that is reflected in the fact that I wasn't able to find a lot of information about migration in, in, in the southwest, uh, which may be attributable to the, the lower population. Yes, I, so. Uh, what is the nest structure for the fish? Let me get your opinion on this, okay, because I'm, I'm, I'm not sure. I, I want to focus, you know, this is a great environmental success story, and I wrote this book because environmental writers tend to focus on the grim and the tragic. You know the doom and the gloom, and I wanted to give readers a break from that. Not not that there's not a lot of grim and tragic in the history of the bald eagle's relationship with the United States, but there's redemption too, right? And there's this great, you know, this is a story that we deserve a pat on the back for. And as I say in the book, when you see a bald eagle flying in the sky, you're witnessing a pat on the back for what we, you know, what we did right. Uh, so I want to write. I'm think I want to write another environmental success story. And I, because I think as we face these challenges of the 21st century, we need some positive reinforcement. Um, we don't need just negativity. And to show that we can do it again. So I'm thinking about writing a book on the history of environmental successes, focusing on perhaps four uh, major stories, um, you know, like the bald eagle, but not the bald eagle. And, uh, but I'm also thinking of writing a, uh, a book cultural and natural history of the of, of the black bear. How does that sound to you? Would that be a book you'd be interested in reading? Okay. There's a hand, yes, somebody's got his hand way up in the back. Yeah, uh, we've been watching some uh, eagle fledglings for the last three months, and uh, it seems like right now they're on the side of their nest that are flapping their wings. Yeah. When will, when can, we've been at so they, they will fledge around 16 weeks, uh, 12 to 16 weeks. No, 12 weeks, excuse me. Uh, they will fledge usually right around 12 weeks, but they'll stay in the territory, stay in the nest uh, until 16 to 20 weeks because mom and dad continue to feed them. It's like us keeping food in the refrigerator for our kids. Uh, and so they'll stay around until about 20 weeks around the territory. And when they do leave, Will they stay in the area? Because we've noticed another young eagle. That was a previous, more than likely a previous generation that came back after it migrated because it remembers mom and dad fed it. Uh, and, and there's often fights between mom and dad and, and their kids from the previous year. So they, they're, they're concentrating on the current generation rather than the past generations. So more than likely those juvies that you're seeing this year the, 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 that are a year or two old went off somewhere else and they've come back. And then osprey hawks fight in the air, in the air. Yeah. The yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Unbelievable. Yes. Yes. It's unbelievable. And uh, we're out of time. I'm, I'm, the hook is coming and pulling me. No, the talent. The talent is coming. Like you said, Jack will be signing books out if you have any other questions that weren't answered. But thank you again so much for coming. Have a great day.